Hi, everybody. Uh, that was a great introduction. So I think I can just dive right in and start talking. Uh, before I go, if anybody wants to like ask me any questions, it's no big deal. Raise your hand. I'm happy to chat about any of this. Um, but to start, uh, we're going to talk about scrounging, which is figuring out how you're going to power your system, uh, sipping it. So once you're at your powered system, how are you going to just take as much as you need and no more? And then the third thing, which I think is most important, is seeing power. So how are you going to validate your system to be sure it'll always work instead of like, ooh, I hope I have enough power from that solar panel in there to make it run. Um, the, the big thing to remember here is it's architecture. It's all about architecture. If you have a bad architecture, it doesn't matter how nice your switch mode power supply system is running. I don't care if it's 98%. If you've got another chip in there that's consuming like a milliamp all the time with no sleep function, it's game over. So you have to make sure that as you're picking things out at the beginning of the design phase, you're getting it right. And that even comes down to the type of power that you use. So uh, just like being at the bar at 2 AM, the fact that they're serving beer at 2 AM doesn't mean you necessarily want the beer at 2 AM. You might want to wait on it. Uh, it's just like that with, with some alternative energies. Um, we'll start with wave energy. Everybody likes wave energy because uh, it's like all the rest of the power sources we're talking about, it's free. So you can grab it from waves, you can grab it from people spinning dynamos, you can grab it from people biking, but you want to do some back of the envelope calculations before you dive into this. First, because it's a lot of moving parts and it's annoying and expensive. Uh, second, it's really not a lot of power. So if you have somebody sitting there turning a crank, that's like 10 watts. Turning a crank for six minutes to get uh, one watt hour, it's like, that's not a good deal. You don't want to be doing that. Uh, so another way to consider it is the wave energy equation, or the kinetic energy equation we have here. If you put something on the ocean and you expect a linear charger, so basically it's coil wire on the outside and a mass on the inside with a magnet, uh, that one half mv squared is what is operating on your little tiny mass that's going up and down. So if you calculate that, like, OK, my mass weighs this much, and it's going to go this fast because the waves are going this fast, how much energy that is, it's usually not a lot, especially relative to the entire contraption that you're running. And what you might want to think about is maybe I should just put a giant battery in there. Because the chances are you're going to be designing a circuit that's so low powered that you could service that battery every 10 years. So do I really want to spend the time, the money, and all the risk associated with these devices so that I can say I'm running on wind or wave in this case? It's not always a good circumstance. So another technology I want to talk about is thermoelectric. Uh, if you have a situation where you've got a ton of heat and you can grab that, it'd be great to run on power forever. Volcano, sweet. Uh, engines, awesome. They're really great, but the trick is you have to get that heat out. All these, so I gave an example of a part that can generate a little over half a watt, but that's assuming you have a 60 degree C temperature differential. And in order to maintain that, if you have something sitting at, let's say, 150 degrees, you have to get the other side of the thermoelectric generator down to 90 degrees. So now you've got to dissipate all that heat on something that's this thin and transferring heat from that 150 degree C side out the other end. So now it's not a circuit question, it's a thermodynamics and a mechanical engineering question. How are you going to get that heat out? How are you going to keep the cold side cold? The other thing is it's not only if you mess that up that you don't get the power you were expecting, but they have a thermal limit to these devices. So if you design something in that's sitting on a 150 degree C engine or whatever, uh, and it's got a 200 degree C absolute max before it starts to get damaged, so if your engine overheats, what happens? Have you been able to keep it cool enough? Are you OK to keep running on this system? So you want to consider very carefully, is this really the right choice for me, or should I go with another approach? Uh, usually the way people go through things is like the most sexy covered in news alternative energy to the least. So I'm kind of following that track. The next one is solar. And uh, solar is wonderful because it's more reliable than the other two. Like you can generally figure out what you're going to have. Uh, I went on, the EU runs a delightful website where you can go on and you can tell it for this location and my solar panel is going to be at 30 degrees or zero degrees. Uh, how much power should I expect? And they give you this graph in like five seconds. 
Uh, I put the link in, so if you get the slides, I would anybody that wants to use solar power, grab this graph. And it's striking how little power exists. So I live in beautiful Rochester, New York, and I pulled up what a six watt panel would do for me, and it turns out it's, it's 4.11 watt hours for a six watt panel per day. So that means it's the same as if you put it in full sun for 45 minutes. That's a lot to think about when you're saying, uh, do I really want to have solar power running here? Uh, you're going to be generating tons here all summer long, uh, not so much in the cold, cold, dark winter of Rochester. Uh, so another thing I want to talk about with solar is MPPT, so maximum power point tracking. And it applies not just to solar, but also thermoelectric. Uh, and you want to focus on this maximum power point where uh, the solar panel sits. It'll be in the spec sheet. Like, we would like you to be at 5 volts in order to get the specified 6 watts out. OK, great. So there's lots of chips. Some of them you can program. Like, I want you to regulate your output current so that your input voltage stays at 5 volts. Uh, that's called maximum power point programming. Uh, and then there's maximum power point tracking, which you set that, and then it diddles its input voltage in case there's like a cloud or the sun just rose or whatever. It'll find the maximum power point at that time, and that's maximum power point tracking. So this is like amazing, and everybody that I talk to says, we got to have it. we got to have MPPT because we're running on solar, and that's the way to get the most energy out. But all the chips that run this, unless you want to roll your own solution with a microcontroller, all the chips that do this cost between 5 and 25 milliamps to run that. So if you're doing 30 watts, it's like, sweet, run it, MPPT, 100%, got to have it. But if you've got like a 1 watt or a 3 watt panel sitting on there, now all of a sudden, your efficiencies are getting killed by that offset. And even worse, in the morning, you might be using more energy than you're getting because the sun just rose and you're chewing up 25 milliamps, but you're only getting 5 or 10. So it's a bad deal in a lot of cases, to the point where putting in a linear charger and dealing with all the heat loss is a preferable solution, not to mention like a tenth the cost. So uh, make sure that you're considering all these fancy devices they have relative to what your system requires. Here's a couple pitfalls that I just wanted to note. Um, it's around the fact that a solar panel could be at 0 volts, and it could be at 7.7 .7 volts. So I, I keep giving the 6-volt panel. This is the specs of the 6-volt panel. It's got an open circuit maximum of 6 volts. Or no, I'm sorry, 7.7 .7 volts. 6-watt panel, 7.7 .7 volts open circuit. Uh, there is a supplier that sells that panel with this charge chip with an absolute maximum rating of 7 volts. Uh, that's probably not good. It's probably fine if you're just like building one or two. But uh, if you put that into a product that's going to be sold, that's probably going to be a mistake. Uh, you'll, get, you'll get nailed by that. So you want to be mindful of the large swings. Similarly, a lot of these places depend on you having this huge open circuit voltage. In the case of this, this uh, 3652. This is one of the MPPT chips. Uh, this is by Linear. They need 7.5 just to get started. So they show you like in their app note or their design notes, like here we have our six watt, six volt panel running with this chip. And it's like, well, yeah, but until we get a sunny day to kick the thing off, it's not going to even start running. So it might be 11 o'clock in the morning before you start capturing any energy. So you always want to be mindful of like, this could be almost no voltage or a lot of voltage. It could be a lot of current or almost little current. All right, so that's how we got our power. There's, there's plenty of power uh, for what we want, hopefully if we did our calculations correctly. So we're going to move on to how we're going to use that power. Uh, LED, debug LEDs, the last guy was talking about debug LEDs, they're awesome when you're plugged into a wall, burning fuel to run your system. <laughs> Not so great when you're trying to count microamps. So there's two design goals that inevitably come out of the situation. And every design will sit in one of these two places all the time. You either have a ton of power like to the point where you could use more, if you had more things to do, it's free power. It's there, your battery's full, your system can pull energy out of the environment faster than you can use it. Or you've used it all up, it's the dark, cold winter, and you don't know how you're going to get through the rest of the day. Uh, both of these scenarios happen all the time, and you get to pick when you're deciding how the balance between how much power you use and what 
generation system you want to use, you to pick how much time you want to spend in either of these environments. But there is no situation where you get to skip both of them. Uh, which brings me to my next point, the B. My, if you ask my wife how we track our finances in the house, she goes, mm, that's the B. We don't talk about the B. It's the budget that you have to run for every system that you get. Generating power, using power, and with alternative energy, you have to calculate multiple different iterations of it. Back, getting back to you're either starving for energy or you've got way more than you think you could ever use. So if you're running your low power mode, maybe you slow your data rate down. What does the power budget look like in that use case? Or if you're going to say, like, all right, we've got to run firmware updates because our battery's full and we've got tons of sunlight, let's run firmware updates. What does that power budget look like? How much time can I run that firmware update before I start to deplete my battery to a point where I have to worry about breaking my device? So uh, there's all these different considerations that you want, and the, the power budget is really where it comes down to. And you want that documented, and I'll go into why in a second in the validation phase. Uh, another condition that you have to consider your, here when you're running your power budgets is the shipment condition. So you put, you design this product, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, it goes on a boat and it sits there for three months. And it probably sits in a warehouse for six more months. What's it doing? How much power is it cons consuming? When your customer opens it up, is it going to be dead? How pissed would you be opening up your $200 device and you get a note being like, please put in the sun for six hours before use. It's like, I live in Rochester, we're not going to get six hours of sun until May. <laughs> what are you talking about, six hours? So you want to be mindful of all these conditions that come up all the time. Uh, the other thing you want to consider is over-discharge situations. So inevitably what your customer is going to, or your client is going to do, or your end user is going to do, is they're going to take the device, they're going to use it for however long they're going to use it, they're going to deplete the battery till it shuts itself off, and then they're going to stick it in the closet for six months, or 12 months. So what's your device doing in that scenario? Are you going to self-discharge the battery to the point where it no longer is a battery? It's just a, a big lump of nothing. Uh, so there's things you can do like putting in protection circuitry is absolutely cutting everything off before you get to the point where the battery cuts itself off so that you could have you know, six months, 12 months, 24 months before the battery actually starts to uh, kill itself because it's been sitting there doing nothing. Uh, and the last piece is you always want to see, if you can, is there a way to get wall power to charge your device? Inevitably, somebody's going to want that. Like, all the time, somebody's going to want that. Uh, so if you can put a little charger in there, even if somebody's got to take apart a panel or something, it'll win every time. Otherwise, you're going to have a lot more returns from the customer saying, hey, it's broken, and I'm not going to wait six hours in sun to get it to come back. OK, so we've got our power. We're using our power. We have our power budget. We think we have a product. We got a product. We feel good. Everything's running the way we think it should run. Uh, what are we going to do about seeing it and validating the power? I have this axiom that my clients both love and hate. They love it when I'm trying to get a job. It's like, if I don't see it work, it doesn't work. They love hearing that until it's time to release the product. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean you can't release it yet? You're not done testing. No, nope, haven't seen everything work. And I would encourage everybody to take that approach, especially when dealing with these weird power situations, because there's so many opportunities for people to put themselves in a situation where the device can't bring itself back to life. Uh, so here's, for a long time I was using this really nice source measure unit to do all my low current testing, and then I got to the point where I had to count like nanoamps. So um, I put together this, this device, and I thought it was trivial, but uh, to the point where I, after I started using it, I hit myself in the face, being like, how did I not think of this sooner? So everybody here might have thought of this, but I wanted to make sure that I put this up. Anybody with a DMM can do low current measurements. Uh, if you put a very large sense resistor in, and then a switch that you can flip for when the system boots up, and then once it goes into low power mode, so you'd like have an LED in your firmware turn off when it goes into low power mode, you flip the switch and then you start measuring the device. Really simple, I hope I'm not boring you, but <laughs> I've used it so many times that uh, I think it would really help people out. All right, so uh, there is a special warm, warm feeling I get 
when I can validate that my system uses the two microamps or the one microamp or whatever the, the budget says and I see it on my readout, like, oh, that is nice. Um, but there's a firmware exercise that's even better than that, and that's stepping down the power by turning each chip off one at a time. And then you can validate your power budget at each stage. So I know that my LED driver chip turned off. I know that my Wi-Fi chip turned off. I know that whatever chips are going, shut them down and watch each one. Because you could be in a situation where even though you're getting all the way down, it's not as you expected. And you've got to reconsider all of your power budgets because something, while everything together works, it might not work the way you expected. And it'd be worth checking out. Uh, and then let's say you don't get that warm feeling. And I, this, I swear to god, this happens every time. You plug it in. You get it so that it's running, and you're using more power than you thought. Mm, I hate that. Uh, so you got you to find the leak, right? Uh, and so the firmware test where you step it down is a great tool, especially because it doesn't involve a soldering iron. But uh, I just start ripping stuff off the board. I mean, KCL matters. So you can pull stuff off the board, like, OK, here's a node of current. I'm going to take that branch off. I'm going to take that branch off while watching the current and seeing what falls. And then you can figure out what part is consuming stuff. So I've got an image there of, like, I just ripped all that circuit up with a hot air pencil, you know, heat it up and push it off. And then you can take it to the point where you can see what each part uses. Uh, it's very common to do things. If, I, if you forget to connect, like, a solar panel, believe it or not, your circuit can consume more energy than if it was not there because it was expecting a load at the input of your charge circuit, and it wasn't there. And so you're using more energy than you thought. I mean, by like microamps, but it's still enough to get you running around your lab for a couple days wondering where the hell all this power is going. Mm. I love this slide because uh, it usually uh, frustrates firmware engineers to no end. Uh, I, so in the release package for firmware, uh, I have added many different power tests, because as I'm sure anybody who's done low power systems knows, you can make one very small change to firmware and have a very large impact on power budget. And usually what it is, is the changing of how often the thing wakes up. So if you went from waking up once a second to once uh, a millisecond, that's a big power difference. And so you can quickly throw it on the scope and just verify, you know, are we getting the ticks that we were expecting? Are we seeing all the power jumps that we thought we would see? Uh, and if you can check that, then you can be comfortable about releasing the design. OK. And the last piece is validating all the possible use cases. So a typical charge discharge curve, uh, I, had a, I designed a system here that was charging. And we had, if you look, the green is voltage. And it cut off charging. I'm sorry, the green is current. It cut off charging before it was really supposed to. And so it got in this motorboating condition where it would, the battery would relax after it didn't get that whatever current I was giving it. Yeah, it was getting like half an amp. After it stopped getting that half an amp, the battery voltage would relax. And it would say, oh, I got to charge it again. And it would charge it again. And then it would come back down and it would charge it again. The reason being, the cutoff current of the constant voltage phase of that charger was wrong. And so you got into this dot, 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 dot situation. And so you're not getting as much energy as you should, not to mention that doesn't look very nice. Uh, so you want to validate that by just watching it on the scope. Set your scope to the slowest way and just let it do its slow curve up and watch the current fall, just like I have here. Uh, the other thing that you got to be very mindful of is a cloud event. So in solar, clouds come. How does your system deal with that? It's all happy running in steady state, and then a cloud comes, and the entire front end of your power system has got the feet knocked out from under it. What are you going to do about that? Uh, so you want to make sure that you can handle that. It's, you can use just like newspaper or whatever to simulate that. It's really easy to do. It's not a big deal. But uh, you don't want to get into a situation where it just shuts off and gives up until it goes totally dark and starts back again, which some, some charge chips do. So you got to be mindful of reality coming and hitting you. Uh, motorboating, motorboating on weak power input. So the sun rises every day and delivers power to your solar panel in very small amounts. And it ramps up throughout the day. That happens every day. If you have a chip or if you have a battery that's like, I don't know, way, way down, if a chip would wake up, it would say, you need to get 
energy, but you only need a little bit because if you're in an under voltage protection situation, like if your battery cells at 2.6 volts on a lithium ion, it says you really shouldn't be getting our full charge current until you have 2.8, 2.9, something like that. So I'm going to give you this really tiny amount of charge current. Um, so it will hold there for a little while. And if you, I'm sorry, I'm doing the back from dead scenario. Uh, I'll do that in a second. So the motor boating on weak power input is the sun comes up. It's just a very small amount of power. Uh, and the battery says, great, I need tons of power. Give me everything you got. And it shuts down the solar panel. Like it just collapses it. It says, oh, I guess the sun went away. And so it sits there and does nothing. And then after it gives up on charging, it tries again. And it realizes that it's taking too much power and shuts down, tries again, and again, and again, and again, and again. This whole time, you're not generating energy. And so we're back in the scenario where it gets to 11 AM, and you haven't saved any power in your battery, and your whole budget's way off. So you've got to be mindful of uh, how you're going to handle that. Now, back from dead, uh, if you have the system that's way undercharged, and you don't give it enough power to get through that uh, under voltage protection, then you can be in a situation where it never comes back. Doesn't make sense. Uh, I have no idea why I wrote that in that slide last week, so I'll just skip that. Uh, so that's everything I really wanted to go over.